all listeners welcome to itihas an indic history podcast and you're listening to episode 45 of the season vijayanagara we had concluded the previous episode in this vijayanagara gajapati war mini series at a crucial juncture in the vijayanagara history the great emperor devaraya the 2 had passed away his inexperienced and not so talented successor mallikarjuna raya had ascended the throne and the dark clouds of war were already hovering around vijayanagara its arch rivals the bahmanis and gajapatis were more than eager to commence a pincer move to finish it off with their opportunistic alliance will they succeed in their plan is mallikarjuna raya able enough to hold against them this is what we will see in detail in this episode in a short time the bahmani and gajapati alliance had arrived before the walls of vijayanagara with a vast army of horse infantry and elephants in the beginning mallikarjuna was forced to take the defensive and weather a siege but he soon sallied out of the fort engaged his enemies in an open battlefield and drove them back in the late war around 1453 ce though mallikarjuna had the advantage on his side he didn't capitalize on it due to a misplaced focus and pouring all his efforts to save the capital and not paying enough attention to the distant provinces especially in the northwest and northeast that had been growing weaker and weaker even in the konkan region the maratha vassals had grown rebellious and this is where mallikarjuna raya's immaturity and short sightedness become clear which only vindicated the bahmani sultan's strategy to turn the screws on him and the bahmanis followed up this with conquest of the strategic forts of chaul and dabol The sultan encouraged by these successes had his main general Mallikul Tujar personally invade more of Vijayanagara's Konkan provinces but his progress was brought to a sudden halt close to Bishalgarh where as a result of treachery of one of the Maratha chiefs from the Shirke family Mallikul Tujar and his whole army of 7000 men were mercilessly massacred This disaster cut off all further progress of the Bahmani armies into the Konkan for many more years to come. But the coastal fortresses of Chaul and Dabol were finally lost to Vijayanagara. Sometime around 1457 CE, four years after the loss of these coastal fortresses, Vijayanagara was forced to make a further sacrifice of its territory. This time, it was in the northeast. The provinces of Telangana and Andhra Desa had drifted into a sort of anarchy ever since the disappearance of the Reddy kingdoms of Kondavedu and Rajamandri. Taking advantage of this situation, the king of Bidar, Humayun, laid siege to Devarakonda. The Muslim armies committed all sorts of excesses such as plundering and destroying villages and towns and enslaving people. The Velama chiefs of Devarakonda reportedly appealed to Kapileswar Gajapati of Kalinga for help and the latter readily responded to the situation. He was certainly not motivated to come to the rescue of the Hindu population in the troubled Vijayanagara provinces as it is reported in some Muslim chronicles. But it was more of his own personal ambition of extending his political authority over coastal Andhra and Telangana. The ruling dynasties of Kalinga never left any stone unturned in this matter. Ever since the beginning of history of the region and so also were the Gajapatis. So Kapileswar Gajapati too must have felt it a wonderful opportunity for carrying out his ambition. He invaded Telangana in conquered coastal plains between the rivers Krishna and Godavari on his way and liberated the country of sorts from his perspective but he did not stop there 
and he crossed the Krishna river and marched over Kondavidu and Udaygiri Rajyas of the Vijayanagara kingdom, which was certainly not necessary in order to rescue the Hindus in Telangana. It was a mere provocation and an opportunistic aggression against his rival. Further, he conquered the regions and victoriously penetrated into extreme south over the territories held by the Sions of Pandyas, who were the vassals of the Vijayanagara kingdom. The Gajapatis plundered temples at Kanchipuram and other places on the way. The atrocities of ruthless destruction and cruelty that the Gajapati armies perpetrated on the people who were Hindus after all came to be proverbialized as the scourge of the Odian. The Odian in the reference was the king of Odra or Kalinga as the country was also known. In memory of this invasion Kapileswara Gajapati assumed the title of Kanchi Kaveri Pati or Lord of Kanchi and Kaveri. This humiliation by the Gajapatis was the last nail in the coffin for the incompetent Vijayanagara ruler Mallikarjuna Raya. Mallikarjuna was able to do nothing either to protect his vassals or his own subjects during these enemy invasions. The Kanchi Kaveri campaign of the Gajapatis had broken the proverbial camel's back and soon things started unraveling with the reigning king of Vijayanagara. And this is where the fascinating character Saluva Narasimha enters the scene. He was the chief of the Chandragiri fort in the modern Chittor district of Andhra Pradesh. Saluva Narasimha was the most powerful among the subordinate chieftains of the Vijayanagara kingdom. While well, the kingdom became namesake. He was a recognized leader of a number of chieftains of the Saluva lineage who founded a number of principalities at different places. over a wide area from the modern Kolar district of Karnataka to the Nellore on the coastal strip of Andhra Pradesh. The Gajapati menace at the time was mainly borne by Salo Narasimha. After Gajapati's left, Narasimha felt that unless something drastic was done in the existing conditions, both himself and the empire would have to face a worse catastrophe from which none could recover. Salva Narasimha had steadily risen in power and prominence to the detriment of the central power system at Vijayanagara. When the first dynasty of Sangamas was deteriorating in power and prestige following the death of Devaraya II. Udaygiri Rajya was partly included in the dominion of Salva Narasimha. In the Gajapati invasion was an opportunity for his further progress in power and glory. by presenting himself as a sole savior of the kingdom while safeguarding his own territorial possessions and political position in the event the romantic chronicle of the saluva chiefs saluva abhyudayam describes that narasimha marched against kapileswara gajapati and defeated him near the fort of udaygiri though these chronicles should be taken with a pinch of salt and how far some of its statements could be considered as trustworthy and whether he could finally occupy the fort because Saluva Narasimha had to take another occasion to lead an expedition on the fort of Udaygiri in the year of 1470 CE he had to march at first instance on the fort when he started on a campaign to curb down the rebellious chieftains of Pandyas and Cholas in the deep south to make his way to the problematic territories in the south as the entire coastal strip of southern andhra desa up to kanchipuram had fallen in the hands of the gajapatis like we saw earlier as we saw in the foundation episodes occasion of enemy aggressions especially when the kingdom was fast declining in power and prestige due to internal problems such as an economic crisis or exhaustion in the incessant wars of expansionism the local power structures would readily seize the ruling house in a subtle manner to increase their po- own power and influence such times tend to increase the importance of military forces and as their leaders the local chieftains gain power and prestige ultimately 
declaring their own independence in light of that it is doubtful whether mallikarjuna raya assigned salva narsimha the responsibility of countering the gajapati invasion or narasimha himself assumed this mantle on his own initiative either way the victory scored against the armies of the gajapati king kapileshwara certainly enhanced his power and prominence and this was the final nail in the coffin for the weak and incompetent vijayanagara king mallikarjuna raya in 1459 ce salva narasimha led a successful palace coup against mallikarjuna and sent him to the fort of penkonda under the pretext of overhauling the administrative structure of the empire salva narasimha allowed the deposed king only the royal dignity and etiquette taking over the entire administration into his own hands and arranged to run through his agent tirumalai anna dalappa interestingly mallikarjuna raya seems to have had a son born during the period of his captivity at penukonda and his name was ramachandra the child formally succeeded to his empty titles the term salva the dynastic appellation of narasimha literally meaning a hawk or an eagle famous for sharpness of sight ferocity and physical strength among the world of birds it is supposed to signify a military title in this context it was said to have been originally conferred on one of his ancestors mangappa dandanada the line of kings of the salva lineage supposedly traced their descent from the yadavas and described the city of kalyani as their original home mangappa dandanada appears as one of the military officers in the service of bukka the one and came to limelight in the south indian expeditions of his son kumara kampanna and that he earned the title salva for his valor and military capabilities in the war against the madurai sultanate mangappa was also conferred fiefdoms in the karnataka region adjoining the telugu speaking country which became the ground for the political growth of the kings there were a few more personalities that belonged to the same salva family who distinguished themselves with their ability and loyalty during the rule of the sangamas as a consequence they amassed a lot of territories and influence on a side note it was the same expedition in which kumara kampanna had liberated the sacred city of madurai from the genocidal madurai sultanate if the listeners remember we had looked at this painful chapter of south indian history in one of the foundation series episode if you are a new listener and haven't yet listened to the foundation series episodes then there is a lot of back story and context that you would be missing if you have the time and interest you must check it out it will be worth your time now it is worth mentioning that salva narsimha was a nephew of the husband of harina the sister of devaraya the second and hence remotely related to the ruling sangama dynasty so clearly he had better access to imperial politics during the weak reigns of mallikarjuna and virupaksha he was standing as the main protective force of the kingdom against aggressions of the bahaminis and gajapatis proving himself as wise enough to utilize the situation to extend his power and prestige on all sides taking advantage of the declining fortunes of the sangamas salva narsimha began to style himself as maharaja as early as 1460 ce but the change of power was not to be so smooth obviously as the then ruling head of sangama dynasty called virupaksha the second who was the son of devaraya the third came in his way and usurped the throne in 1465 ce after the death of mallikarjuna raya virupaksha the second secretly gathered troops and enlisted support of some chieftains who opposed salva narsimha and grabbed power after which virupaksha sets aside ramachandra 
the infant prince and the son of Mallikarjuna Raya and ascends the throne. With this, a political crisis is temporarily averted. It was a crisis that was manifesting due to the rise of Salva Narasimha and the casting of his shadow on the Vijayanagara throne. But this was a mere temporary respite to the already imploding Sangama dynasty. As Virupaksha II was an equally incompetent ruler just like Mallikarjuna Raya. And it was not at all suitable to rule the kingdom at such a critical time. Virupaksha cared about nothing but wine and women. He was cruel in his behavior and he ended up making more enemies than friends among the nobility and the polity of Vijayanagara. Adding to this, he also came into conflict with the Arab traders on the west coast, which only ended up being advantageous to the Bahamini Sultan, who sent an expedition over Konkan coast in 1469 CE and deprived the Vijayanagara kingdom her earnings by controlling the foreign trade. Just as Virupaksha II was unraveling himself and burning any last traces of goodwill among his subjects for the imploding Sangama dynasty, Kapileshwara Gajapati dies in 1468 CE. The death of this powerful Gajapati ruler benefits the Bahamini Sultan more than anyone else as he is relieved from the anxiety of potential contenders for supremacy in that region. And the ensuing civil war that crops up in Orissa among the sons of Kapileshwara Gajapati only improves the Bahamani position strategically. One of the sons of Kapileshwara, Amabira, requested the intervention of Bahamani Sultan to help him in the civil war to ascend the Gajapati throne. The Bahamani Sultan hence had a free hand to deal with the Vijayanagara Empire as well and it was left to the utterly unsuitable king Virupaksha II to face the situation. And this situation came as a blessing in disguise to Salva Narasimha to once again project his personality as the sole defender of the kingdom and as being the right person to rule instead of a weak Virupaksha. This provided him with a splendid opportunity to strengthen himself to seize the throne. And with this, we shall end this episode and the fourth part of the Vijayanagara Gajapati war mini-series. I sincerely hope the listeners enjoyed this episode. If you did, please hit the subscribe button and leave a rating and a review wherever it is that you are listening. A huge thank you for taking the time to listen to the show. I hope to see you soon in the next episode. Till then, this is Narendra Vikram, your host and narrator, signing off. Hope you have a great week ahead.